All right, how's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, we are going to be in Acts chapter 7 tonight, so if you have your Bibles, you can open it up to Acts, sorry, it does say chapter 7, chapter 11, if you open up to chapter 7, you won't be able to follow anything that I'm saying. So Acts chapter 11, while you do that, I was going to introduce myself. My name is Greg Altmeyer. I serve as one of the pastors here at Walnut Creek Church, one of the pastors that does not own any, is it Diori? Diori, I don't own any of that. Sorry, Brian. Um, but yeah, I serve as one of the pastors, and I help to oversee our global ministry. And so Walnut Creek Global, that's kind of the arm of the church that seeks to mobilize, train, send, and support long-term workers overseas, church planters, uh, or missionaries. And so as a church, we have a, a heart to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. And currently, there are really billions of people around the world that have never heard the gospel, never heard uh, of salvation that's available in Christ. And so our heart as a church is to just join the Lord in what he is doing and just do our part in bringing the gospel to those people. So with that, I'm just going to read our passage. It's Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. I'm going to read that, and then I'll pray, and we'll jump into the text. Let's read that. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a large and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agab Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is faithful and it is true. Lord, it is trustworthy. I pray that through the power of your spirit tonight, you would speak through your word to the hearts of your people, God, that you would edify them and build them up. Lord, that you would encourage them, exhort them. God, I pray for those that are here that don't know you, that you would use your word to pierce their heart, God. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for salvation in Christ. Lord, so we just pray for our time. Pray that it would accomplish your purposes. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, to help us work through our text tonight, we're going to look at three different sections. Three sections, and these are that the gospel moves, the gospel saves, and the gospel transforms. The gospel moves, the gospel saves, and the gospel transforms. And the first two will be a little bit shorter than the last one of the gospel transforming. So without further ado, let's jump into the first section, the gospel moves, starting in verse 19 of our passage. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. And so what is, what's happening here? Luke is 
describing this in verse 19. And what he's doing is he's actually going back to uh, Acts chapter 8, the beginning of Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. So in the first seven chapters of Acts, we see the birth and the development and the growth of the church in Jerusalem. Do we have a little map here? We had a little map here. Right there. So in Acts chapters 1 through 7, the gospel is centered in the city of Jerusalem. And this is a direct result of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is poured out, and Peter preaches to thousands. Thousands get baptized, join the church. And then there's a lot of activity, ministry activity happening in the city of Jerusalem. And then in chapter 7, Stephen, you all know this, for a lot of you, this is review. Stephen gives a passionate message. Um, and then he is stoned to death as a result. And then what results is recorded in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1. It says, Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way, preaching the word. So from this, believers are now scattered outside of Jerusalem. And over the previous number of weeks, we've been looking at these passages. We've been looking at the movement of the gospel. So immediately after this persecution, we see Philip go to Samaria and Judea throughout Acts chapter 8. You know, in the first part of Acts chapter 8, Philip goes to the city of Samaria so he goes north there to the city of Samaria, and he preaches, and the Bible records his interactions with Simon the magician. And then in the second half of chapter 8, uh, he is sent to the south, to the road connecting Jerusalem and Gaza. Uh, down there, many believe it's over there by uh, Hebron, and it's here where he engages with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and he baptizes him after he comes to faith. Then in Acts chapter 9, we see the conversion of Saul on his way to Damascus on the road to Damascus, and the events that follow that. And then Acts chapter 10, it details the first conversion of Gentiles to Christ in Caesarea, up there. So you can see, throughout the first 10 chapters of Acts, this movement that has been happening with the gospel. And the result of this is in the first half of Acts chapter 11. Peter, he has to go back to the church in Jerusalem and detail what has happened with these Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. And so that's a little bit of the build-up, certainly review, but that's some build-up to where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. I think it's helpful just to visually see what has taken place with the gospel in this region. And so all this has taken place from Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 11, and now what Luke is saying in the text is he's saying, hey, you remember those believers back in Acts chapter 8, those that were scattered because of the persecution, this is what happens to a portion of those. This is what happens to some of those believers who were scattered. And so Luke records that the believers scatter as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to just Jews. And so this map zooms out a little bit. You can see that these believers, they go up to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. But he also records that other believers from Cyrene join those from Cyprus to go to Antioch. And you may wonder, how in the world did the gospel get to Cyrene? Well, if you are in your digital Bible, you can scroll up, or your paper Bible, you can flip back to Acts chapter 2. And during Pentecost, there are actually people from Cyrene that are in Jerusalem. And so when Peter proclaims the gospel, men and women of Cyrene, they hear it, and they respond in faith, and they're baptized, and then they go back home to Cyrene. And so in Acts chapter 11, Luke is saying that men from Cyprus and Cyrene, that they go all the way up north to Antioch, and they begin preaching to the Greeks. And so let's take a step back. What are we seeing here in the text? Well, it's pretty obvious that we're seeing movement of the gospel. We're seeing movement of the gospel. And we see that here in the book of Acts. We also witness that in our lives. We witness that the gospel moves. The gospel moves. And why does it move? And really, it moves for two different reasons. Again, both of these reasons, I think, are observable in the text and are also observable in our lives. The first reason that the gospel moves is because people move. The gospel moves because people 
moved. So we have people that they move from Cyrene to Jerusalem for Pentecost. They come to faith and they go back to Cyrene. There are people that are moving. We have people that due to persecution are moving out of Jerusalem. They're going up there uh, to Cyprus, to Antioch, to Phoenicia. That's because people are not stagnant. And this isn't true just in the scriptures, but also in our lives. So to prove this, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever lived in a place other than Iowa. If you've ever lived in a place other than Iowa, raise your hand. Okay. So you can see, I don't know what that is. That's about 80% of the room that have lived in a place other than Iowa. You know, in our lives, there are so many reasons why people move. You know, growing up, you move because your parents move. They get a different job or they move closer to family. You know, many of you, probably most of you, have moved to Des Moines to go to school. Some of you will finish school and you'll continue on with more schooling, probably in a different state, at a different school. Some of you will take jobs after you graduate from school outside of Des Moines in a different city, in a different state. And we see that as people embrace their identity as believers, oftentimes they will move from place to place. And as such, the gospel itself has the potential to move. And so the gospel moves because people move. That's the first reason. The second reason that the gospel moves is because people become so impacted by the gospel. The gospel impacts them so greatly that it causes them to yearn to go someplace with the sole intention of bringing the gospel. It's not because they took a job somewhere. It's not because uh, they went to school somewhere, but it's purely because the gospel has penetrated so deep into their heart that there is a yearning for them to move and take the gospel to a different place. And this will basically be the rest of the story in Acts, starting in Acts chapter 13. The gospel is moving purely for evangelistic reasons. Whereas a church, all the folks that we have sent overseas to plant churches, they aren't moving there because they love the food or they love the culture or they love the climate. They're not moving there because they want their kids to have a unique childhood. No, they're going there solely to bring the gospel of Christ. Or take the spring break mission trip. You know, historically, Campus Fellowship students they haven't driven 48 total hours to and from Florida because they think that St. Augustine has the best beaches in the U.S. or because they really want to see what college in Florida would look like. No, they're going there because the gospel has resonated in their hearts and they want to go somewhere and take that gospel and share it with un believers. And so oftentimes this means geographically moving yourself from one place to another. Yeah, and this truth of the movement of the gospel is not just true in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 and 30. Uh, it's true throughout the entire book of Acts, and really uh, the rest of human history from Acts until today, that the gospel moves. And so that's our first observation from the text there in verses 19 and 20, is that the gospel moves. The second observation is that the gospel saves. The gospel saves. Picking back up in verse 20. But there are some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And so a theme throughout Acts is not only the movement of the gospel, but it's also the power of the gospel. There's undeniable power contained within the seed of the gospel, which is the message that by choice and by inheritance, that you and I are completely and utterly ruled by our flesh, that we are slaves to our sin, but that God, being rich in mercy, sent his son, Jesus Christ. Christ in the flesh who lived a perfect life and then he voluntarily went to the cross and on the cross he died in your place and he died in my place that he took on the wrath of God that my sin and your sin deserves and then to all who look on Christ with faith who believe that the only way for them to be viewed as righteous in the eyes of God is to be covered by the blood of Christ who bend their knee to yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that those people with that type of faith will be saved. And this is the message that the people in 
Cyprus and Cyrene would have spoken in Antioch. They would have proclaimed the good news about the Lord Jesus. And when the good news was proclaimed, it records that a large number believed. A large number believed this message and turned to the Lord. And this would have been the sing- single greatest thing that could have happened to those people in Antioch. You know, their need was not more education. Their need was not a revamped political system. Their need was not better business practices or economic growth. No, their need was eternal, and it was the salvation of their souls. And it's the same thing for you here today. If you're here and you are not a Christian, your biggest need is not that you do well on your next exam. Your biggest need is not that you get the summer internship that you want. Your biggest need is not that you find that girlfriend or boyfriend that you're longing for. It's not that you get your body exactly the way that you want. It's not that you get enough eyes or likes on your Instagram posts. No, your biggest need is eternal. Your biggest need is the salvation of your soul. And the only thing that can save your soul is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved. And this is the gospel that has been preached to you. If you're sitting in this room, if you've been coming to midweek, the Bible study, campus fellowship for any amount of time, you have had this gospel preached to you. The question is, have you received it? On it, have you taken your stand? And by it, have you been saved? Because it's only by this gospel that you will be saved. That's our second observation in the text is that the gospel saves. Now the last and a little bit longer observation and section that we have is not only does the gospel save, but the gospel transforms. The gospel transforms. So to help us see the transforming power of the gospel, we're going to look through the rest of our text, just verse by verse, starting in verse 22. We're going to focus primarily on how the gospel transforms the person of Barnabas person of Barnabas. So Acts 11.22 says this, news about them reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. Now Barnabas is someone that uh, we have heard mentioned a few different times in the story in Acts so far. We're first introduced to him in Acts chapter 4. It says this in verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so this is our introduction to the person of Barnabas. And we don't see him again until Acts chapter 9. And after Saul's conversion, Saul attempts to join the disciples in Jerusalem. And we see this play out in Acts chapter 9. When he arrived in Jerusalem... He tried to join the disciples, he being Saul. But they were all afraid of him, since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So again, another brief mention of Barnabas here in Acts chapter 9. And then he's not mentioned again until our passage in Acts chapter 11. So that's all we have in terms of background of Barnabas, but we can see a few different things. We can see that Barnabas was generous with his finances to the church. We can see that he supported the apostle Paul, uh, made a defense really for him, for the other disciples in Jerusalem. But we get a bigger picture of Barnabas in our passage here. So we're going to jump into how we can see that the gospel transforms to the person of Barnabas. The first observation is this. We see that the gospel transforms us to be glad when we see the grace of God. The gospel transforms us to be glad when we see the grace of God. Verse 22. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad. 
Now, obviously, when we see the grace of God in our own life, we will be glad. Whether that is the grace of God through the gospel of salvation, or if that is the grace of God to overcome an area of sin, or the grace of God in his provision for us, in all these areas, I think we will obviously be glad when we experience the grace of God. However, how do you respond when you see the grace of God working in the lives of other people, or in other churches, or in other student ministries? Are you glad? Do you rejoice? Or are you jealous, envious, critical? You know, this is uh, such a challenge for me. Oftentimes, I hear stories of how God is working in other churches. You hear about the size of the church or the number of baptisms that they had or the great overseas work that they are doing. And my first inclination is often to discount or to discredit it, to try to poke holes in it. And all I'm doing is really trying to puff myself up with pride rather than to humbly praise Christ for the work that he is doing in his bride, the church. And so the gospel should transform our hearts to be glad when the grace of God is on display, not just in our own life, but in the lives of other believers and in the lives of other ministries. So the gospel transforms us to be glad when we see the grace of God. Secondly, the gospel transforms us to encourage and exhort believers. The gospel transforms us to encourage and exhort believers. Verse 23, Acts 11 still. When he arrived, this would be Barnabas, and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. How does Barnabas respond when he sees the way that God is working among the Greeks in Antioch? He encourages them all. There is an immediate response by Barnabas that he desires the good of his fellow believers. And it isn't just that he encourages one of them or a subset of them, a couple of them. He encourages them all. So I want to ask, do you encourage your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And do you encourage all of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do you encourage just a few, the ones that you easily get along with? As the gospel transforms us individually, it should propel us to really pour out ourselves into the collective body of believers with edification and encouragement. This is what we're called to in Hebrews chapter 3. It says this, verse 12, Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Again, encourage each other daily while it is still called today. Encouragement from both Barnabas and the author of Hebrews is the same. It is an encouragement to be true to the Lord, to be devoted to Him to not give way to sin's temptation and deception. And I would encourage you in the same thing tonight. I would encourage you to remain true to the Lord. I would encourage you to possess devoted hearts to Christ. I would encourage you to not be hardened by the deceit and deception of sin. So the gospel, it transforms us to encourage and exhort believers. The next thing that we see is that the gospel transforms us to be a good man or a good woman and full of the Holy Spirit. The gospel transforms us to be a good man or a good woman and full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Now, the reason that Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit is not because he was a good man. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is works-based salvation. Rather, Barnabas was a good man because he had been transformed by the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll say that again. Barnabas, the reason that Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit is not because he was a good man. 
Rather, Barnabas was a good man because he had been transformed by the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ as Savior and Lord, God begins a work of transforming you inwardly by the power of his Holy Spirit. And as you yield to this work, as you yield to the work of the Spirit, it will begin to produce fruit in your life. We see this fruit listed, described in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do these fruits describe your life? If friends, roommates, classmates, family members were to describe you, would they use these words? Or rather, is it the works of the flesh listed just prior in in Galatians 5 that would describe you? It says this, Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, Hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. When you look at your life, which list describes you? Which list describes your heart? Are you being transformed by the Holy Spirit? The gospel transforms, and it does so by the Holy Spirit. We see this in Barnabas' life, and the Lord's desire is that you would all be described as good men and as good women, full of the Holy Spirit. And the gospel transforms you to that end. Continuing on, in the verse 25, we will see that the gospel transforms us to desire to do ministry with other believers. The gospel transforms us to desire to do ministry with other believers. Verse 25, Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. You know, Barnabas does not stay in Antioch to do ministry among the new believers on his own. No, instead he goes and he looks for his partner in ministry. He goes and he looks for a partner, and he finds Saul, and he brings him back. You know, Barnabas, he wanted a partner in the ministry. And this has been modeled for us all throughout the Gospels as well. We see Jesus, he calls his 12 disciples, and he does ministry with them for three years. When he sends them out, he sends them out how? Two by two. And the scriptures are littered with one another commands that require another person to obey. So the Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation. We are designed to do life and to do ministry with other believers. So I would encourage you, if you feel as though you are currently doing life alone, if you feel as though you are currently doing ministry alone, to tell someone, to ask someone to come alongside of you in this walk of life, to seek out a brother or a sister that you can do life and ministry with. The gospel transforms us to this end. It transforms us to desire to do ministry with other believers. Next up in verse 26, the gospel transforms us to teach the Bible. The gospel transforms us to teach the Bible. Acts 11, verse 26, for a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So when Barnabas and Saul are present with these new believers in Antioch, what do they do? Do they just do life with them? Do they hang out? Do they shoot the breeze? What is described as their relationship? Well, we see in the passage that they met with the church and they taught them. You know, they would have taught them from the Old Testament scriptures. They would have opened them up and walked through that. They would have talked about the fulfillment of, of all the prophecy in the Messiah in Jesus Christ. They spent an entire year teaching them and training them. And to learn from Paul and to learn from Barnabas would have been quite the experience. I think there's two different things that we can do with this. The first is ask the question, are you being taught the Bible? 
are you being taught the Bible? And this would take place both with daily Bible intake on your own as you study the Word. Certainly, there's definitely the component to that. But there's also a piece where it takes place as you gather together as the church. We see in this passage at the church, at the church they met together and they were taught. So I want to ask, are you regularly in the local church, sitting under the teaching of God's Word? This is certainly not the only way or method, but it is certainly one main way that God transforms us through being taught the Scriptures. Secondly, are you teaching anyone the Word of God? Are you teaching anyone the Word of God? As the Gospel transforms us and as God's Word instructs us, the natural outworking will be that we want to teach others. We want to share with others the things that God is teaching us. Do you have that person or do you have people in your life that you are able to teach, that you're able to share with what the Lord is teaching you? Do you even feel equipped to be able to do that? You don't need to have all of the answers to teach people about the Bible. You can share what you know. You can share what the Lord is teaching you. You can share how the scriptures are impacting your life. So the gospel, it transforms us to teach the Bible. And lastly, the gospel transforms us to be financially generous. The gospel transforms us to be financially generous. Verse 27. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who live in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. So while Barnabas and Saul are in Antioch teaching the church, there's a prophet named Agabus that comes to Antioch and predicts a famine throughout the Roman world. And how do the disciples, these new believers in this church, how do they respond? They respond by taking up an offering. And they send relief to their fellow Christians that are located in Judea. And this gift is then delivered by Barnabas and Saul. And the only description that we have of their gift is that it was given in accordance with their ability, which implies that those that had more gave more, and those who had less gave less. And this is money, again, that they are giving to Christians that they have never met. They don't know who they are in any way, shape, or form. They've never met them. You know, greedy people, they don't give money to people that they know, let alone to people that they don't know. And to those who hold on super tight to their possessions, they don't give money away. But the gospel, it transforms us, and it transforms us more than just in our knowledge. It transforms us in how we view money and possessions. The gospel, it frees us from the chains of unrelenting greed. It frees us to give because we recognize that all things ultimately are the Lord's. They're not ours. And the gospel shows us that God himself gives, that God, get, that God is the greatest giver. He gave his one and only son for us. So how do you think about your money and your possessions? Are they yours to be used and consumed for your own desires? When you think about graduating from school, are you excited to get a job and make as much money as you can make to buy as many possessions as you can buy? I want to ask, are you being generous with what God has given you right now? Right now. You know, the Lord, he doesn't need our money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. But he desires our heart. The Lord desires our heart. And one of the areas that best displays our heart is in how we think about and treat our money. So tying this all together, we see from Acts chapter 11, verses 22 to 30, the transformative power of the gospel in the person of Barnabas. We see these things. We see the gospel transforms us to be glad when we see the grace of God, not just in our own life, but in the lives of other believers and other ministries. We see that the gospel transforms us to encourage and exhort believers, not just the ones that we really like, but all believers. 
He said the gospel transforms us to be a good man or a good woman full of the Holy Spirit, to yield ourselves, to allow the Spirit to work in our lives to produce fruit. The gospel transforms us to do to desire to do ministry with other believers, not to be in isolation seeking out our own desires, but rather to seek uh, fellowship and ministry with other brothers and other sisters. The gospel transforms us to teach the Bible and also really to desire to sit under the teaching of God's word. And then the gospel transforms us to be financially generous. That's what we see in the life of Barnabas from Acts chapter 11, verses 22 to 30. And when we look at the whole passage, starting in verse 19, we see that the gospel moves, the gospel saves, and the gospel transforms. And so how should you think about this? How should we as believers in Christ think about this? How should it impact you? Let's go through those one by one. The gospel moves. I want you to ask, how could God use you to contribute to the movement of the gospel? How could God use you to contribute to the movement of the gospel? There's certainly not one way. There's multiple. I think that one obvious option is the upcoming mission trip over spring break. This is a great chance to see the gospel move onto college campuses in Arizona. The gospel is still spreading throughout our country. It's vital and it's necessary on college campuses, and this is an, a great way to be involved in that. So I want you to ask, I want you to think about, how could God use you to contribute to the movement of the gospel? With the gospel saves, I want to ask, have you been saved by this gospel? Have you been saved by this gospel? If you're here and you're not a Christian, this point is for you. The Bible says that you are alienated and separated from God because of your sin. But in his deep love for you, he has sent Christ. And that offer of salvation is available to you tonight. It's available to you right now. The gospel is more powerful than whatever sin or bondage you may be in. The gospel is more powerful than whatever in the past you have done. It's more powerful than whatever in the past has been done to you. It's the only message that is able to save your life. So I would implore you to consider what the Lord is offering to you through Christ. Ultimately, I would implore you to repent of your sin, to trust in Christ for salvation. And then lastly, that last point, the gospel transforms. I want to ask, have you been transformed by this gospel? For those of you that are in Christ, have you been transformed by this gospel? If you believe the gospel, have you allowed the Holy Spirit to conform your heart and your life to the likeness of Christ? Have you forsaken areas of sin and bondage that consume you, that are so appetizing to your flesh? Are you pursuing life with other believers? Are you pursuing a life that is full of the Spirit? Are you pursuing the fruits of the Spirit? Are you sitting under the regular teaching of God's Word? The gospel is not just to bring the dead to life, but it is a gospel that is also able to change your life right now. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the power of the gospel. Lord, it is a gospel that moves people. Lord, it is a gospel that moves with people. Lord, it's not held back by any any borders or boundaries or governments or institutions, Lord. The gospel is all-powerful because it is yours. Lord, it was created by you and for you to redeem a people to yourself. God, we thank you that the gospel saves, that it is the power of salvation contained within the message of the gospel. Nothing to do, no acts to commit, Lord, to be in right standing with you. You desire a broken, trite heart, Lord, one that has yielded to the lordship of Christ. Lord, I pray if there's anyone that is here that doesn't know you, God, that you would reveal to them their sin, that you would make it painfully obvious that sin will only lead to death, that they would see the offer of Christ, that they would accept it, that they would bend their knee to your lordship, 
Lord, that tonight would be the night that they are adopted into your family, brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And lastly, Lord, we thank you that the gospel transforms. Lord, that we aren't stuck in our ways from the day that we were saved, Lord, but you conform us in the likeness of Christ. Lord, that there is a battle waging between our flesh and our spirit. God, but that your spirit is all-powerful. Lord, that it can produce in our hearts, in our life, the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would experience love and joy, peace. Lord, that we would experience patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, that there would be ever-increasing in us individually as believers and collectively as a church and collectively as a ministry. Lord, please praise you that you're good, that you're faithful. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.